and since '96, uh, he's a professor at the University of uh, Thessaloniki, and he was uh, director of the institute there for some years. And in fact, in practice, we met uh, many times in the uh, European context uh, in the organization of the European Opticon program, which some of you may know about. But since a few years, his hobby, I don't know whether I should say hobby because it takes you full time almost, <laughs> he, he's a member of the research, research group for the Antikythera mechanism, which is gathering seven scientists of various disciplines, astronomy, mechanics, uh, chemistry, uh, paleology, and so on and so on. And they are investigating in full details this Antikythera mechanism, which he will talk us about. As you will see, probably it's the moment to remember that we should be modest in this room, because as somebody said, we are all working on the shoulders of giants. And the concept of this mechanism was certainly a giant. Unfortunately, the, his name is not known at the moment. But maybe John will give us more details about that. Thanks a lot for coming and telling us all this interesting story. Thank you very much. This, this doesn't seem to work. Is there something here? It's not a mute. It is. Is, where's the, the microphone? Oh, he's fallen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I cannot see here. Could you please uh, yes. see that I put it right? Something like this? No. Yeah? Yeah. Try to speak. Is it okay? Uh, you can hear me. Yes. Very okay, good. So excellent. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank excellent. you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for inviting me, Michel. Um, yes, we have met many times. We know each other as astronomers rather than uh, collaborators on the Antikythera mechanism. And I'm very glad that uh, in this institution of astronomers, there are quite a few people to attend this lecture. Um, by the end of this lecture, I hope that you know a little bit more about the Antikythera mechanism that has surprised us very much uh, in the last 10 years or so. Um, oh, OK. Well, this is a reminder uh, um, for switching off your, um, uh, um, your mobile phones. Okay, I, I start with three little topics. One of them, uh, why the anti mechanism is such an important artifact. Uh, the second will be about how it works. And the third one will be if it was, and how, how, uh, how was it driven with. Okay, first of all, I think it was the world's oldest computer. And it was really a computer because it had input. It was doing calculations with gears, and eventually it was displaying the gears, not, um, not, not in, in, in the sky like a planetarium, but quantitatively, so that people could make predictions. It had actually the output on scientific scales. Um, how did gears make, compute, uh, make computations? It is very simple. If you have a gear of 60 teeth and you uh, merge it with one, another one with 30 teeth, then when the first one makes a full rotation, the second one makes two rotations. You have multiplied by two. And of course, depending on the number of teeth, you can make any multiplication or division that you can think of. For example, we have found trains of gears that calculate the division between 235, which is the metonic cycle, and 19, which is again the metonic cycle, in years. The first one is in months, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Many, many, many things like this. Um, in fact, um, there was a journal in 1984 that, for the first time, it did say then, back then, a long time ago, that <laughs> did the ancient Greeks have the first computers. This is a, from the micro uh, uh, well-known journal. Um, it is, uh, for me, as important for the evolution of technology, which is a very wide field, as it is the Parthenon for the evolution of architecture. And finally, uh, it gives us an idea what a laboratory uh, in ancient Greece could do. Uh, these, I think, are the most important things about uh, this artifact. Now, let me just say in one slide uh, what it was. First of all, it was um, an astronomical computer. It could calculate the position of the sun and the moon. So it could calculate the position of the sun and the moon and the sky. Of course, these objects, as you all know, they all uh, orbit around the same or almost the same plane, the ecliptic. 
So you only need a surface to predict the position and not a sphere necessarily. And this is what the anti mechanism did. Um, now, if you know the position of the sun and the moon, then you can predict eclipses because eclipses we have when the three bodies, the sun, the earth, and the moon are aligned. And if the earth is between the sun and the moon, then of course you have a lunar eclipse because the sun rays cannot reach the moon. If the moon as it rotates around the, the orbits of the earth is between the sun and the earth, then you have solar eclipses. I will show you how it did this. It had also a social phase. It could predict, it could say when the inauguration of the Olympic Games uh, was, uh, was. So I, uh, this is something that we had not expected, but we have found not only the Olympic Games starting dates on the mechanism, but also all the other crown games, games of ancient times, the important games, the ones that the, were, uh, the prize was not money, it was not hrimatites, uh, but it was stephanites <coughs> games, the crown games. It was, an, it was a very complicated device and because of this, the maker, the person that constructed it, who was obviously not a user, in, inscribed in it, in fact in two protective uh, doors or little doors protecting the front and back plate, a full user's manual. We have uh, deciphered up to about three and a half thousand letters with the corresponding words and sentences. And these are mainly uh, astronomical but also some technical and some uh, geographical notes as well. Okay, uh, the third topic that I'm going to briefly discuss is how was it driven? Was it like a, one of our clocks mechanism that we know? Uh, did it have a clepsydra or some sort that could empty and then uh, put a weight goes up and down and calculates time? Uh, no. Did it have a kind of um, pendulum like the old clocks? We haven't found any. Did it have a kind of spring? Couldn't find any. In fact, I think they did not know how to make strong strings, uh, springs in ancient times. So it was manually driven. It was driven by a knob. The user used to turn a knob. This knob would uh, turn a crown gear. And this would, have in, in, in part, uh, give motion to several trains of gears, driving seven pointers that I will show you wh what they did. In fact, recently, we have found that this knob, this beginning of the motion, could not be given at the side of the mechanism, as we all assumed after about a year ago, or two years ago. Uh, there's one publication now by Manos Rumeliotis, who has made um, an investigation of the, both friction and momentum between uh, the gears. And with this, he has found that the most probable place to actually um, drive it is it from the front, from the lunar pointer, or from a, a little um, a round thing that was there. Um, Okay, now let me, after this introduction, let me go 2,000 years back. Uh, it was between 85 and uh, 68, so I say between 70, around 75 BC, when a large boat, an Olkas, one of these large boats that was uh, bringing wheat from Egypt to the northern shores of the Mediterranean, and this is France, Italy, East Spain, France, Italy, Greece, uh, Asia Minor, Turkey nowadays, um, a very large boat, a boat that was probably 40 meters um, wide, so 40 meters long and about 15 meters wide. We know that this boat existed, but this was one of the largest. As Brendan Foley, who is the archaeologist that dives in the Mediterranean, he has dived in very many places, told me once in Brussels and we were in a conference, this must have been the Titanic of the time. It was a very large boat and um, it was trying to go from the eastern Mediterranean, we know this because of the uh, cargo that it had, uh, probably going towards Italy, and uh, it was trying to go through the straits between Peloponnese, southern Greece, and Crete. There is a small island there called Antikythera, uh, which nowadays is inhabited nowadays in the winter, maybe by 30 people, not very, not very many. But it was always known in the ancient times. It had several names from the, from the ancient times. Um, the boat did not make it. It sunk just outside the harbor 
of uh, Antikythera called Potamos. Uh, in fact, let me show you if my mouse works. Can you see my mouse? No, my mouse doesn't work, so I have to... For some reason, my mouse does not always work. So this is... it, it, it was found about here. Yeah. So maybe it was trying to go into the harbor. In fact, something that I, I very seldom have, maybe the first time, we know now that there was a second... Uh, a, a second um, a shipwreck 200 meters away of the same era because as the archaeologists have told me the amphora and other ceramics that they have found are of the same era the same the same time so maybe they were going in tandem and uh, somehow they both sunk there at the same time maybe pirates we do not know okay the boat was full the boat was full of uh, merchandise uh, up to about three or four years ago, I was saying it was full of marvelous artwork. Not only, not only statues and, and other artifacts, but also had lots of amphora, lots of pithy, lots of lagany, lots of other merchandise. Uh, it was such a big boat that it was used usually for merchandise, for carrying goods, but also passengers. So because I probably forget later, uh, five skeletons have been found there from a small child, a woman, and some, another three, uh, or part of it, not, not full skeletons. Uh, in fact, one of them, I hope that I will not take too much time but saying these details, I think they are very important. The most recent one was the scalp of a skeleton that was intact, it was very well preserved because it was inside uh, sand. And immediately, of course, we all jumped in and said, now this is a place to do some DNA analysis, but it has not been done yet. Uh, it is one of the oldest um, possi possible uh, DNA analysis that can be done, and it is very important. I hope that the archaeological uh, the, the, the ministry will give the, the, the uh, permission to do this. Okay, um, this uh, much later, 2,000 years later, it was uh, Tuesday before Easter in 1900. Two Simiot boats from the island of Simi. Simi is a tiny little island, which is here. Um, uh, we're trying to go to northern Africa to collect sponges. And uh, so for some reason, maybe another bad weather, uh, forced them to put anchor at the Potamos Harbor. And again, for some reason, maybe out of professional curiosity, or before they, because they wanted to test another diver suit, diver suits I have um, photographed this in the island of Simi uh, a few years ago. Um, or because you want to show to a novice how to use a, to, to use a diver suit. Or the scenario that I like most is that it was Tuesday before Easter. So it was um, in Greece, we are fasting. So maybe the captain Kondos said to Elias Likopandis, uh, one of the best divers they had, could you please dive in and bring some uh, some shells and some other seafood that is allowed to be eaten during fasting days. And instead of bringing any seafood, he came up with a bronze arm of um, a, a statue. The diver di dives as well. He uh, confirms that a big shipwreck has been found. He came, in fact, up and says, I saw a lot of mermaids down there because there were so many white marble um, uh, uh, statues there. Anyway, they went back to Africa, they came back full of sponges, they went to see me. They, there they discussed it with the uh, wise men of the city, of the island, and a professor of um, the University of Athens. And they decided to come to the ministry in Greece and explain what they had found. They did so soon after the minister of, um, of um, uh, education Responsible, responsible for um, culture as well, uh, with the help of the Ministry of, um, of Defense, the Stratioticon they were calling it at the time, they decided to do a large-scale expedition to bring up the, whatever they found in the boat. The two, the, the Simeots go with them, and between 1900 and 1902, they came up with lots of new artifacts. Um, I will show you uh, a couple of these now uh, in shortly, but please notice that the, 
the, the, the shore there is very rocky. In fact, the, 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 as the water goes, as it goes down in the, in the sea, it is very abrupt. Uh, the shipwreck was found 50 meters away from the shore and 50 meters down, an inclination about 45 degrees. Um, okay, let me now show you some of the uh, pictures from the time. I have some of them I have taken from Cousteau, the Cousteau Encyclopedia. And here are some of the statues that they have been just put at the, at the uh, portico of the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Uh, later they cleaned many of them and they, some of them were in pretty good condition. Uh, and now, uh, somehow I'm, I'm getting very slow here. Uh, if you go to the Archaeological Museum, they heard that some of you they have been there. Um, and uh, you can see uh, down, if you go for a cup of coffee, lots of lots of, of marble statues. They're all from the Antikythera shipwreck. You can see Achilles, you can see Ulysses, you can see the, the horses of Diomedes, big ones, I mean really, really big statues. Um, now, what is important, we say, look, look at this, let me see if I can get any piece of paper because, oh yes, here's something. Uh, because my, maybe my mouse doesn't work because, no, my mouse doesn't work anyway. I, I can see it here. Now, look at this statue here. Uh, part of it is very clean, and the other part is very, it's, it's this almost destroyed uh, after 2,000 years in the bottom of the sea. Uh, why is this? Did the microorganisms, they like the left side and not the right side? Of course not. Uh, half of it was buried in sand, and so it was preserved. The other half was not. But as I told you, uh, the, the, the depth is very steep. No sun could stay there for millions of years, or ten, thousand, ten, uh, hundreds of, of thousands of years to be formed, uh, according to marine, uh, people that do marine excavations. The sun must have been the ballast of the, of the boat, where the statues are wedged not to break during storms. Um, the Antikythera philosopher, we do not know who he represents, one of the most beautiful bronze items in the Greek museums, in fact 90% of the Greek museums' bronzes, they come out of the bottom of the sea and not from the land, because bronze was a very precious material and they would recycle it. And um, uh, they had also nice um, uh, glassware, uh, jewelry, there was, don't forget there was also a woman, at least one in the boat, and for some reason, to the credit of the Simiot divers, they brought up a lump of something that was probably greenish and um, uh, it had some, it was a bit heavier. It looked like one artifact. It was almost thrown away from the boat according to the calendar that I have read, but an archaeologist there said, well, keep it. It could be important. And in fact, it was the most important cargo of the boat. Um, that was the, it was going to be the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, newspapers, they publish, so I have, left, I have checked uh, about uh, five years worth of five newspapers between 1900 and 1905. We have found 440 clippings concerning the shipwreck and the Antikythera mechanism. And there, the idea that gears from ancient times propagated in the world and a, a British subject um, Derek the Solar Prize, who was working at Yale University at the time, hears about it, he takes the first plane, he comes to Greece, he gets the permission from the, Antikith from the Archaeological Museum to uh, work on it. Uh, he collaborates with uh, Karakalos from the Democritus Nuclear Center to make uh, the, the first radiographs, as they call them, probably hard X-rays, soft gamma rays, we do not know. And this is one of the pictures that he has in his, he had in his archive. Now he started studying this, uh, he, he did some good work, and he presented a model. He has made many mistakes, but because, because of his model, because of his studies, and because of his book or extended article about uh, the gears from the Antikythera uh, shipwreck, uh, I am here giving this lecture. Uh, later, uh, other people did work, uh, this is getting a bit slow, let me see, uh, worked on it, for example, between 1980 and today, 
uh, Michael Wright uh, and Alan Bromley, but not La Alan Bromley now because he died soon after, uh, investigated the mechanism and lots of good work has been done by these people. Now you can see Michael here in front of the noises, the Technological Museum of Thessaloniki, uh, and uh, he's holding his um, model, his replica of the, of the mechanism. Uh, in the, this is the, the backside with two spiral uh, 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 dials uh, and the front side with two homocentric circles. I mean, this is the first time Price thought that these were homocentric circles as well, which did not make sense. Now we know that the spirals, they make good sense of what the anti mechanism did. And uh, this is rather getting slow, and I have to, I don't know what I shall I do. A big collaboration started in 2001. We got a permission from the ministry. Uh, the major group consists of five people at the top, archaeologists, uh, paleographer, uh, some other people. Alexander Jones is a very important person in this uh, uh, investigation. Uh, and uh, we started now working on the fragments and the things that we have been able to uh, work on. The largest group at the time is in Thessaloniki, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki or the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki. And uh, we are all working uh, on, the, we have the largest group in the world at the moment. Uh, now these are the four largest fragments. Uh, this is uh, all the rest of the fragments, the 82. And um, uh, one of them is rather important, fragment F, found by Mary Zafiropoulou. Uh, in the, uh, she excavated, she made another excavation at the cellars of the Archaeological Museum. Uh, the letters on the inscriptions point to a dating between 150 and 100 BC. We have several letters of it, I'll give you only one of them. This is a letter Pi, uh, which is here. It has a, a small, oh, come on, come on, come on, there it is, coming up. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm getting slower and slower, and I'm not what shall I do. Um, okay, this is the letter Pi. Uh, nowadays we write these two equal length um, feet, uh, legs, and uh, in ancient times, uh, but not after 100 BC, the right leg was shorter and it was making this bend, etc., uh, etc. Et we have the letter M that was doing like this. It had sheriffs all over the, in all the letters. Uh, the letter Omega had a special way of written, etc., etc. Now, um, this is probably what the mechanism looked like. Um, and this is the Aristotle of University uh, model. Uh, it had two concentric circles uh, in the front and two uh, spiral dials in the back. And uh, we had, of course, to find a way now to investigate what we have in our hands after getting the permission from the ministry. And uh, first of all, we invited uh, Tom Max Bender from California, Palo Alto. He was working at uh, Hewlett Packard at the time. He came and he brought with him a machine that had, uh, it was a hemispheric globe with uh, 50 little lamps, uh, bulbs, like a bicycle bulb in it, and computer cards to actually drive them. And when you press an enter in his laptop, uh, it, after of course switching the lights off, the first bulb comes on, a photograph is taken. The photograph goes on the, uh, on the top of the, this hemispheric globe. Um, the second bulb lights on and you photograph 50 bulbs, 50 photographs. And what is the difference between photograph to photograph? Uh, because neither the fragment nor the camera have moved, but the direction of the bulb, of the light, and the distance of the bulb to each pixel was what was different. And because of this, Tom was able to, uh, to, make, um, uh, to, to make this kind of photograph. And you see the first one that I've just shown you uh, had lots of inscriptions that you, you could hardly see. Now you can see every little thing on the surface of all the, the fragments. But more important was um, a device, a tomographer, that came from London, from Trigg, in Hertfordshire, a bit north of London which was an X-ray tomographer, much stronger than the ones that we use in hospitals. 
in the, 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 the gun or the X-ray gun was 450 kilovolt that would penetrate uh, 16 centimeters uh, of bronze and calcification. That was the largest of the fragments that I showed you. The largest one is about 16 centimeters by 15 uh, and a few centimeters in width because of the calcifications. So you can see it here being installed in the archaeological museum. And uh, the next thing that I can show you, my goodness, this is getting very slow. Uh, I'm pressing the button more or less right away. So this is the turntable, the usual tomographer, X-ray gun, detector here. You start rotating it, and every half a degree or 0.1 of a degree, whatever resolution you wanted, uh, we will take a photograph. So you should take about 3,000 photographs per rotation <coughs> in, the, in our best resolution. Uh, we did use a very, a very precisely and well-made program from Germany, from Heidelberg, uh, that helped us to do the work. So it was very expensive, but our university managed to find the money and buy it. Uh, so here is some of the tomographies that uh, uh, I would like to show you. Fragment D, fragment A. Uh, we had lots of data, so we had photographs, normal photographs. We had the photographs of Tom Maltzbender's technique. Well, we had the photographs or the tomographies that from, the, uh, from the tomographer. And we have we come now to solve the puzzle of the antikythera mechanism. We had a good program. And this is getting so I'm not sure what shall I do about I'm pressing the button about five seconds or 10 seconds before the, photo, the slide comes on. Um, OK. So let me show you some of the reconstruction of the gears. This is the fragment A, the large one. Come on, you're coming. Uh, and this is fragment B, back and forth, E and F. And how do they fit? This fragment, this fragment B goes here. Uh, come on. Uh, fragment E and F go in here. Fragment B, fragment E goes next to it in the center. Mm, la la. I don't know, me, uh, do an escape and see if I can move faster and then go back. Uh, some, some, for some reason, my computer is getting slow. This is a, it's supposed to be one of the fastest. So, okay, so I put an escape here. <laughs> Let me just see if I can go, at least for these fragments, so this is, uh, as I call it, this is fragment F goes there, fragment E goes there. And how do we know all this? We know it because, uh, as you see, uh, the fragments, the tomography shows exactly what I showed you uh, earlier in one of the slides. Let me go back to my presentation to see if it works now better. Maybe it, had, it needed some kind of rest. Let me go to the front dials. Now, the front dials had several features that I have talked about. For example, uh, there was the dials with inscriptions here uh, that um, allowed us to have quantitative uh, results. There is a crown gear that I have talked about, a crown gear. Uh, there is a moon disk. Probably this is the place where the, the, the fragment, uh, the, the mechanism worked from. And this is something that we did not understand originally. originally. What we found in the, in the fragments, the fragment F was this one here. We call it the spoon because we did not know how to call it. It's very small. It is about uh, maybe one centimeter. And uh, it took us some time before we realized what it was. Uh, we found the crown gear, this one here, was exactly here. So it could rotate this around its axis, uh, the inner part of the spoon. And eventually, it was first the first person that noted this was uh, Michael Wright, who said this must have been a way of showing the moon phases. So this was indeed what it was. And uh, please notice here that uh, we have several pointers, uh, like the sun, the moon, and the moon phase. Now, as the thing rotates, it rotates a little spheroid, a little sphere uh, that was half black and half white. It was painted. And uh, as it rotates, then it shows the, f the moon phases. White is full moon, black is uh, a new moon. And of course, the intermediate phases as well. 
So these are immediately now three things that the anti-cathar mechanism did. In the pointer, the pointers were showing on the inside, uh, on the inside, let me show you here, there are two homocentric um, dials, as I have already mentioned. The outside had 365 divisions, which correspond to 365 days, and the names were in the Egyptian, the Egyptian names written in Greek characters. Uh, so you know that the Egyptians, they had the 365 day calendar and not 365.25 as it should be. Uh, the inner uh, dial had 360 divisions and had the zodiac constellations written in Greek letters as we, do, as we speak them today. So uh, as the, the, the user rotates the knob and this rotates several year, years and the pointers, the pointers of the sun and the moon move, he can pick up a date on the outside calendar and then it would show the position of the sun on the uh, inner dial, the position of the moon, which of course moves, moves much faster, and the phase of the moon, uh, which is, uh, we start realizing now that this is a very important calendrical machine. Uh, we did not know exactly what was happening, but then we found out, as we were going further down, that underneath this dial there were 365 little holes of diameter 0.8 millimeters each, very regularly placed. And this perplexed us, and then we realized that this um, outside uh, dial uh, could be removed, it was detachable. So um, every, uh, every four years, the user could detach it, rotate it backwards by one hole, taking that into account leap years. So now we have the Egyptian calendar, but we have added now the, a quarter of a year every four years, which of course makes it into a very, uh, very nice, very precise uh, calendrical me mechanism. Okay. Then the next thing to do, of course, is to measure how many divisions were there. And when we measured them, there was 235, a well-known number to astronomers. Uh, every 235 uh, moons, uh, synodic lunar months, as we call them, the moon comes at the same position on the sky, the same constellation, and has the same phase. Whoever knew the metonic cycle, she could predict full moon, something that was very important in ancient times, because they did not have a switch to make dark into light, to make night into day and do some work. They did work with full moons as much as they could. Okay, um, inside, inscribed in it, was, uh, as you see, uh, another subsidiary dial, uh, which had four divisions. And Economo said at some stage, he was a professor of physics at the University of Thessaloniki, that this could have been a four-year calendar. He was right, but now we know exactly what this calendar was doing. Um, okay, so now I have to go to my, to struggle to go to my next slide. Um, when we investigated this part of the mechanism, we not only found that he had 235 divisions, but it also was full of inscriptions. Um, 235 lunar months, synodic lunar months, is equal to 19 years. 19 years, uh, almost exactly, within, uh, a few, within, I think, four hours. So this is something that the, the Meton of Athens had discovered, and it is mentioned in several texts in ancient times, for example, uh, on the first century BC scripts of Geminos. Um, okay. Uh, so this subsidiary dial we had to investigate and uh, we did in fact immediately and this is what it was. I have put some, uh, some color on what we have found. Uh, first of all we found this L, A, B, Alpha, Vita, Gamma, Delta and uh, immediately the epigraphologist told us that this means a year, a year one, two, three and four and of course, soon after, we found the word Nemea, which are the ancient crown games of Nemea. Uh, they were every two years, very quickly found it in the opposite direction. We knew where to search for the Olympic Games, and we have found it very clearly. Uh, there were four years, every four years, uh, the Olympic Games. And 
uh, opposite it, we wouldn't expect to find anything, but we found the Pythian games that are also every four years, and the Pythian games are the games of the Delphi. The Isthmian games are also crown games in Corinth, and much to our surprise, we have found some more things that um, I will describe you immediately after, but whoever had the mechanism, he could actually send the messengers all over the world saying, stop the war, come to Olympia in peace, and participate in the Olympic Games. Uh, what we found also was the Naya Games, or Naya, that are games of Dodona, Dodona in north northwestern Greece, close to Delphi, a bit further north. And um, this is something that uh, was very strange. We thought maybe it was used in northwestern Greece not constructed there because every archaeologist tells us that most likely the place that it was constructed must have been Rhodes, maybe Camiros, that they had some very nice laboratories at the time of the mechanism, around 120 BC. Also, recently we found the Alia, so uh, a good friend from the United States came, stayed to my house a few weeks, and we actually went together through the fragments again and again, painstakingly, and we did decipher the Alia games, had the games of, the Ro of Rhodes. And that was quite nice, because everybody is expecting to find something from Rhodes. Now, it has also a very well-preserved um, dial, uh, pointer, that you can see it here, some of the X-rays. And uh, let me uh, go to the next slide that uh, shows part of them, and I will try to go fast. Now, look at this here. Uh, the, the, you can see it there. Let me go now in about two millimeters down, and uh, the pointer almost, but not quite, disappears, but there's still something there at the very top where I put a circle. Let's continue with our investigation, go further down, a little bit down again, and there I'm coming to the next slide. The, the pointer has more or less disappeared, but there's still something there, and let's see it, how it looks uh, uh, in the... Uh, next slide, uh, there is a pin there that seems to be going between the gaps of the, uh, of the spiral. And in fact, it does go between the gaps and the spiral. If you take the profile, it looks uh, like this. So it is it has a pin going in the gap, uh, in the gap here. Uh, seeing edge on, it is here. And uh, somehow, if it rotates, it follows the, it forces this pointer to follow the spiral. And um, uh, this is something like uh, the, the needle of uh, the, the old music machines that we had in my time to work on the, uh, with, with, to, to play music. Now, um, this is probably how it worked. And uh, uh, it took, uh, it was following the spiral. But of course, we realize that the spiral has an increasing or decreasing uh, radius. So it has to go to slide, the pointer has to slide in and out. And it did. Our first, re first model was what you see here, uh, which um, uh, soon uh, we discover. Let me see, let me go to the next slide if I can. Uh, say this is the next slide that shows how the pointer construction actually was. It was not simple. So when Kiryakos Evstathiu, our mechanical engineer, saw this, he said, my goodness, I can't believe that they had this kind of technology. Uh, you realize that this here, these holes here, are a few millimeters wide, so maybe three millimeters. This is about two millimeters in diameter. So this is the shaft moving the pointer. And uh, uh, this inverse pi construction was wedged in, or probably secured with, through these holes and the hole on the, on the shaft. Uh, a cap was underneath. In the top uh, row, in the top holes, the pointer was sliding. And most likely, we have found also four divisions here that was for greasing the pointer, so it moves easily back and forth. Now, if the uh, the pointer reached the end of the spiral, of course, somebody had to reset it. And it, it was not nice to reset it by uh, bending it up, but what did they do? They actually uh, took the, uh, the, the, the wedge uh, out, this uh, pin, and uh, they put it 
they, 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 they lifted the whole thing by about two millimeters, so that the pointer, the, the, the pin here, uh, this one was moved out of the gap, and then reset it uh, without losing the azimuth. That was very, very nice, very important construction. Uh, now, uh, let me um, go to the uh, bottom, uh, to, the, to the bottom back dial, which is this one here. Uh, this time it was a four ten spiral and we measured 223 divisions. Another well-known astronomical number, every 223 lunar synodic months um, eclipses, they happen in the same, to the same characteristics. This is the well-known Saros cycle, um, which corresponds to 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. So every 223 uh, lunar months, synodic months, if there's an eclipse today, say a solar eclipse, and 13 days later there is a lunar eclipse, and 6 months later there's another lunar eclipse, and 15 days later there's another solar eclipse, after 223 moons, lunar months, we're going to have again a lunar eclipse, 13 days later we're going to have a solar eclipse, 6 months later we're going to have another solar eclipse, and 15 days later we're going to have another lunar eclipse. Whoever knew the solar, the, the Saros cycle, he could predict eclipses. We know that the ancients could predict eclipses, we know from Herodotus that Thales of Miletus in 585 BC he predicted an eclipse as the Lydians and the Persians were just about to fight over the river Alice in Turkey, in Asia Minor at the time. Uh, and he told them, well, look, the good God is very, 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 he's not pleased with what we're just about to do. He's going to take the sun out of the sky. So good God did this, and uh, the fight stopped. In fact, they decided to have the borders of their kingdoms uh, as the river Alice. So that was possible in ancient times. But please notice that this is end eight hours. This means that the eclipses would repeat like this, but if the first eclipse is in Babylon, the next eclipse is going to be uh, not seen in Babylon, but eight hours later, 120, 120 degrees uh, westward. And this is, say, in uh, Emporium in Spain. And after another, another solar cycle, it will be the other side of the world. And only after three times the Saros cycle, which is uh, 54 years, and it was known in ancient times as the Exeligmos uh, time, uh, which is um, uh, a very long interval of time. So lots of observations are needed uh, for these um, observations, and you can see that we have found the Exeligmos dial here. In fact, there's a number 8 is here, the number 16 is there, and I have really frantically looked for any sign here, because as you know, we do not have a sign, a, a character for the number zero in ancient times. Uh, but we haven't found any. Uh, I'm still searching, but I think it's in, pain, in vain anymore. Okay, uh, now let's investigate this, and I will go to the next slide. This is fragment A and fragment F. Uh, you see some of the tomographies that we have. Let me go on fragment F, which is the one that Mary Zafiropoulou discovered in the museum. You probably will kick it in the, in, the, in the beach if you see it, because it doesn't look like anything important. However, if you look inside it, you're going, so this is about, maybe this is about four or five centimeters wide because of the calcification. But inside, it has a very well preserved uh, part of the dial of the, of the Saro cycle, and you can see some details in it, like letters and inscriptions. Uh, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Uh, so letters are here, inscriptions as well in some places, but not everywhere. And when we started investigating more with better resolution, we found this. And uh, you can see now inscriptions here and there, not here, not here, not there, not there, but there and there and there. So uh, let me put them like this, you can see them. There's an eta, a sigma. The anchor type symbol, symbol is there more or less everywhere. No, every, everywhere. Then there's some letters, uh, for example, the letter 12, the number 12 here, the number 5, 
etc., etc. We do not know what they were. We used to call them glyphs, as we were discussing it with our colleagues uh, who were from Britain. And um, we started trying to investigate what they were. Now, let me see in fragment A as well. This is this part which has also part of the Saros dial. You can see clearly some of the divisions. You can see them there. Uh, and they are, of course, much easier to see in the tomographies. Uh, and let me now go. Oh, what is happening? My computer is. Uh, let me see again some of these. Uh, letters, these inscriptions. Uh, we have found several of them. So these are some of them uh, uh, all around, as you can see them. There is a new one that we have found down here that has two little wedges from a sigma. It is for a... For cell. It is, so we were trying to investigate what this, this, this inscriptions meant, these glyphs. And then we were sitting late at night, say midnight, uh, eating a souvlaki and some beer in uh, close to the museum. Tony Freeth started a discussion, says, okay, this mask has something to do with eclipses. And the xenophone and myself that were there, we said the meeting was Sigma could be Selene and Ita could be Helios, Helios, the moon and the sun. And uh, then uh, that was the beginning. The epigraphologist told us that this Omega Rho, uh, this uh, Angkor type symbol, symbol was, not, uh, 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 was not really uh, um, um, an anchor, but it was the first letters of the word aura, hour, in Greece. So there was omega, rho. Now, uh, investiga recent investigations of two people uh, in our group have dis decided, have uh, investigated the, what kind, what cyrocycle is this, and it is most likely one starting on the 23rd of August 2005 plus or minus one or two calypic years of 55, 54, uh, 54 uh, years. So this is now, again, a dating uh, th through eclipses of the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, let, me show, let me show you uh, some of the inscriptions again and clear them. Uh, maybe I have to do this again, so it takes some time. And if I put some letters, some red letters to see, the inscriptions. This work was done by Tony Free that I showed here. And again, you see the sigma, the anchor type, etc., etc., is all over the place. And this is what was the Helios, Aura, and there's a numerical value. When the pointer was reaching such a division, it would um, warn the user that this month there's going to be a solar or a, a, a lunar eclipse. And the only thing that the user had to do is go in the front where the pointers, the sun and the moon lunar pointer are, and see if they were opposite, then the Earth is in the middle, and this is, of course, a lunar eclipse. If they were together, then this would be a solar eclipse. So this, we have found a device that actually does the um, calculation for predicting eclipses using the Saro cycle. Uh, I can talk to you more about the Sari cycle, cycle if you want to, but it will take some time, so I stop here. Uh, okay, now uh, we have to start to find the gear that was driving this 223 circle. And we did find it. It is here. This is this, this gear here, uh, which uh, it is this one here, which has in fact 223 teeth. When we first published our results in the first publication in Nature that I have given to Michelle some time ago, and she has read it, uh, we decided, said it was 223 or 224. We had a little bit of statistical error. And we said most likely 224 because 223 is a prime number. How can they divide a circle into a prime number, into a large prime number? But they had done it. Uh, and don't ask me why, because I, I, how, because I do not know. However, nearby, so in the next slide, which is coming up, um, come on, uh, it is, we have found, uh, ooh, my computer is playing down. We found two gears of 50 teeth each. They were in fact known from 1903 in the first publication by Zvoronos in an article written in his book by Pericles Radiadis. He had mentioned that there are two gears visible, and in fact said that one of them had a, a cutting. The word, the ancient Greek word was, the, not ancient, the Greek word was endomy. Quite often people were saying that 
this is probably uh, something broken and they had tried to, repla to, re to, to, to repair the, a tooth. However, when we first uh, investigated this, and I will go in the next slide, we have certainly found the endome here, the cutting, and uh, come on, uh, there it comes. Uh, this is a tomography, and what I shall try to do, in fact, I will escape again to show you because I have to go back and forth with some of the slides. Um, I will go now with uh, my, my punch, go up and down uh, by about, uh, so here it is, um, we are here. Now, if I go down two and a half to three millimeters, this is what I see. You see the gears are there, but where is the cutting? There's no cutting here. Let's go back and forth and back and forth. Obviously, there's a, there's a cutting in the upper part, but not in the bottom one. There are two gears, the one after the other, with 50 teeth each. Okay, let me just go on a little bit on this slide because the, this is how it is. When we did uh, a better resolution tomography, this is, and now I have the mouse. Oh, ha -ha. So when I have a presentation, the mouse is probably okay. okay I, I, really, I realize now what happens. Anyway, the cutting was going all the way in, and uh, it was clearly cut, square here, and something was blocking it here. And uh, if I go to the next slide, let me just go here. Um, uh, we found that these two gears, they were not homocentric because two gears of the same number of teeth, one on top of each other, they make no sense. They do exactly the same thing. So we found that these two gears were driven through a pin and slot mechanism. So the, what I said, blocked part, which I, I showed in the previous slide, which was here, it was a pin from the bottom gear engaged with the top gear through a slot. But because the axis was uh, eccentric by 1.1 millimeter, this pin was either engaging the gear, the top gear, uh, I think in my next slide will show it, uh, will show you here, we'll engage it here or there. So here or there. So it was driving it faster or slower. And when Elias Gurtsoyanis, a mathematician, calculated how fast and how slow this was, it was found that this with an accuracy of one to 200, the orbit of the moon around the Earth, as one observes it on the sky, goes faster or slower because the eccentricity of the orbit of the moon is 0 0.055, and it goes faster in the uh, perigee, and slower in the apogee. So it was uh, a very good match, and this is with this fantastic planetary um, construction of gears that they actually simulated this, um, this movement of the moon. Um, okay, this is, uh, now I have to probably go, let's go back, or, uh, let's go here, but go on my presentation, uh, which is here. <coughs> okay. So this is what I have told you up to now. And up to now, what I have been saying is that they did know about Kepler's second law uh, in ancient times. This is it. They, could, they really knew and they had simulated this. And then when we looked at Ptolemy, uh, we found that it is a well-known thing that Hipparchus had calculated. Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm um, taking a lot of time. These are all the gears. Let me just go again so that I go a bit faster with escape and going on this. These are all the gears that we have actually constructed our models. Uh, these are the two, uh, the back and forth plate. So I'm skipping a few of these as you see. And I would like to come back with this slide showing again all the inscriptions on the metonic dial. Uh, this is now what we read eventually. In fact, it was Alexander Jones who did this. And these are the months that there are Phoenicaeus, Craneus, Lanotropius, etc., etc. Every Greek city in ancient times <coughs> had uh, its own calendar, all groups of calendars. And so it was easy for us to go through the 200 calendars of the ancient Greek cities and find with which cities the calendar of the Antikythera mechanism coincided. And 
This is what we have found. It was very close by 100% to the Corfu, the Kerkira calendar. It was very close, except for one month, uh, for the Dodona calendar. But in fact, Machanevs was a, a, an adjective for Zeus, and this is, I presume, this is also an adjective for Zeus as well. Just a different name. Also for Vuthrotos in southern Albania. But unfortunately, no, uh, no, no uh, coincidence with either Rhodes or Athens. So we know now that uh, this is, uh, the cities are here, and you can see them uh, in northwestern Greece again. And uh, this now it is another confirmation. Maybe it was made in Rhodes after the order of somebody, a rich person in northwestern Greece. Okay, now I will um, let me go this and start doing this work. And this will be probably, as I do not have very much time, I will finish with something pretty new. When we investigated fragment D, we found this strange looking um, metal part that was wedged on a 63 tooth gear with the wedge in fact being bent a little bit as they had hammered it in. And when we started discussing it with Kyriakos of uh, he immediately said to me that this must be a cam. And of course, as an astronomer, I did not know what a cam is. So I, I asked him what is it, and he explained to me that if I know anything about car engines, I did because when I was a PhD student in Chartered Bank in England, uh, I had bought a car uh, from Ian Morrison, you probably know Ian, for a hundred quid, a hundred pounds. And uh, I had lots of problems, which I liked because I, I really learned lots about mechanics uh, on the engine of my car. Uh, so a cam is this. It is the one that actually rotates, it has four teeth, and as it rotates, it opens the valves of the engine, so the car works. And the profile of each of these teeth is uh, like this, uh, so it is constant radius, and then increase, and then constant radius again. Now, uh, let me show you another, I found this in the market, in the flea market. Uh, this is another cam, and this is what it calculates. I mean, this is the kind of graph. You can see small radius, larger, 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 rather, and then suddenly going back to zero. So this is a kind of graph that is produced by rotation of this. Now, what is the uh, graph rotated by this one? We did not know. We had to assume that thing was uh, symmetrical. We couldn't do any research on it anyway. So I will go very fast now uh, with all our measurements. And uh, this is what we have. Um, this we found, in fact, is slightly offset from the center of the gear. So whatever curve it was doing was not symmetrical. One side was larger, the, the upper part was larger, and the other was smaller. So I did more research and more and more. And I will give you now what we have found. So first of all, there are four points. Uh, that there is a reversal of the tangent uh, of the, this cam. And so two maxima and two minima. And you have to find, have, well, my task, according to Kyriakos, was to find a graph, an astronomical graph, that had this, this, uh, this, this uh, I guess. And that was, I, I tried my very hard, and I had to find something that looked like this. You see it had two maxima and two minima, and slightly offset it was not symmetrical. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, the first idea was something to do with this azimuth of rising and setting of the sun, that as you know, only during equinox, it rises exactly from the east and sets on the west. In the south, um, it starts, it, in the winter, sorry, in the summer, it rises to the, further to the north, in the summer, further to the south. So it goes faster in the equinoxes, slower on the helio, on the, on the uh, largest days and smallest days of the year. And it has something like this, but when I gave the graph to Kyriakos, he said to me very soon, it doesn't fit at all. Then I tried to, to, to simulate the retrograde motion of, say, this is the true, the real data from Mars. Uh, so Mars goes uh, backwards towards the west, but then some, a few times it goes 
eastward among the stars and then continues like this. But when we tried it, this did not work either. The data were given to me by Professor Tsiganis, who is an expert on dynamical astronomy. And then there was another thing, there was the equation of time that had a graph like this. Now, uh, this is what we had to investigate. We calculated the equation of time for the time of Ptolemy, or around the, the Antikythera construction date. And let me uh, continue with this. Uh, this is a clock, like my, my watch, and the time is measured uh, by rotation of this with equal flow, with smooth flow. Uh, it takes 300, 730, which is 365 days times two, uh, per year, uh, with a smooth uh, velocity. Uh, now, uh, this is how uh, time is calculated. Time is calculated uh, through the rotation of the Earth or the orbit of the Earth, either day and night or 365 days. And for two reasons, A, two reasons, A, because of the, uh, that we measure time on the equator and not on the north or south pole. Come on. Um, hmm. There it is. Uh, and because uh, it is, um, the Earth's orbit is also eccentric, it has, and it does not flow regularly. This is called the apparent solar time. So the difference between the mean solar time and the apparent solar time is the first one moves smoothly and the second one not. Okay, so this is now uh, what is, uh, what we have found. The mean solar time moves slowly, moves, flows uh, smoothly, and the uh, apparent time does not. Uh, did the ancients know about this? The answer is yes, they did. And uh, uh, we have found, in fact, uh, this uh, in the literature. However, once we knew this, that it was more or less fitting, we decided to do some research further more, and we did some good research. And eventually, Kyriakos came up with a nice model and this model with this one here, I hope it comes quickly, yes. Uh, so if you attach a kind of um, anything, a piece of metal that, f that is going up and down because of the rotation once a year by this curve, then it would show the difference between the mean solar time and the true solar time in a dial. And this is now the next slide that, um, shows this, and this is, I'm finishing with this. Uh, when it comes, there it comes, and let me show the graph. Now, as this goes up and down, this rotates, and this is exactly the, the, the curve that it describes. And the, the blue one is the mean solar time that uh, is given by Ptolemy. I think you can see that uh, the coincidence is fantastic. Uh, we are very pleased about it, of course, and uh, let me see. Okay, now the next slide shows uh, something strange that we found. The first day that we were investigating the, the fragments in the museum, we noticed that there is a letter M-E here. In fact, Mike Edmonds was there and we said, hey Mike, how did you manage to do this? Describe your letter name there. No, 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 she said they didn't. But then we looked at Ptolemy and they found that they, they knew about the mean solar movement. It was called the Messi Iliu Epikinesis, which is, of course, uh, the first letter of M and E. Most likely, we have found the gears that did this. And I think at this place, uh, I have more slides. I have another two things to present, but I will stop here. Okay, this is a slide with inscriptions. And I would like to thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for taking a little more of my time, but uh, uh, I had so much to say. <laughs> but clearly there will be some questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, of course, who has questions? Not always the same one starting first. <laughs> no questions? Nobody wants to know who has constructed that instrument? <laughs> Thank you.
wonderful talk, uh, John. I, I have many, many questions, but I will just limit myself to three questions. One is, you mentioned the number of teeth in the gears, and some of them are odd. And therefore, how do you actually divide the circle into an odd number of, of equal teeth? So, so I was trying to talk, repeat, please, because I was talking. So understand. you mentioned the division of the gears into, say, 223 teeth, yes. right? And so are they in text mentioning how to divide the circle into this even number of uh, teeth? Uh, yes, They're in the text we have found all these numbers. Um, um, uh, but it does not say how it was actually done. We did not know how they actually divided the circle in 223. In the text, we have found the number 223, the number 54 years. We have found many of other things. I said the thing at the beginning that I did not know how they did it, and okay. I still do not know. So very quickly, the second question is, also the, the text mentioned planets, but you didn't mention anything about the gears of the planets. Yes. Could you comment on that? We please? have not found any gears of the planets, however, um, we have found inscriptions of all well-known planets of ancient times. Mercury, J Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And because of this, some people, they insist that probably it had also the gearing that was feathered up and maybe there was a stone that came through and actually shaved it off. Um, in our model, we do not put them because we only put things that we know they certainly exist. Yes, yeah, so obviously the interesting questions to ask are who made the device, how many did they make, and what was motivating them to make uh, something so complicated? I mean, what were the principal usages of the, okay. uh, of, of so the device? I mean, was, did every ship have one somewhere? We have not found the, the made in China. <laughs> in fact, somebody who I think is in this audience mentioned this very nicely <coughs> in, a, in a recent exchange of emails <coughs> and uh, we do not know where it was found and how it was found but I think that we know a little bit how uh, why it was made as you have seen it had lots of astronomical um, uh, data on it um, so it was an astronomical device it was probably made so to keep to actually inscribe all the astronomical knowledge of the time in a machine. There was somebody that said, oh, let's, let's do this to keep the astronomy for the, the next generations. Because of this, it could easily be used as an educational instrument. So I can think maybe Hipparchus in Rhodes, um, because Hipparchus died in Rhodes in 120 BC, gathering his students around and saying, well, let's, the mechanism shows that there's going to be an eclipse in the next five days. Let's see why. And then she will rotate, etc., etc., etc. They only made one? Sorry? They only made one? We know only <laughs> about one. No. I think, sorry, just this last question. Uh, I think that there must have been more. We have made lots of mistakes in constructing the, our, mach our uh, simulations. And uh, I'm sure that they also did some mistakes and they had lots of gears made and lots of but we have not found any. Don't forget that 90% of the bronzes in the Greek museums, they come out of the sea, and everything else, maybe an ex exception is the Ineochos of the, the charioteer of the Dona. Maybe in other shipwrecks we'll find more antikythera mechanism, and that will be a big change in our research. Now, there's one question about the dating, I think. About the dating. The dating, because you mentioned that they knew the eccentricity of the orbit of the moon, but that was supposedly not known before Ptolemy. Oh, the eccentricity of the orbit of the moon was known. Was known. Very okay. well known. So the yes. dating about minus 150 is consistent with... Uh, it is very consistent with, uh, with the knowledge there. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed, yes. <coughs> Well, actually, a very quick question, because you mentioned that Hipparchus might have gathered his students, so and so. But are there any texts that refer to this machine or some a similar machine somewhere? Yes. Um, OK, there are two texts that I know of. One of them, uh, or both of them, are from Cicero, who mentions uh, that he first, let me see, maybe I can find it very quickly uh, further down. Do I have anything about it? Here, no. Okay, uh, no. Okay. <coughs> he mentioned that uh, 
When uh, Syracuse was captured by the Romans in 212 BC and Archimedes was accidentally killed, uh, Marcellus, the general, found and brought to Rome two spheres that would calculate the position of the sun, the moon, and the planets. One of them the, he de dedicated to the, uh, in the Agora of Rome, and the other one he left at his home, where Cicero, two generations later, at the house of um, his, uh, ne uh, his uh, grandson, he noticed this instrument. And the other one, by Cicero again, in another of his books, is that when he went in 97 BC to Rhodes to meet his friend um, Posidonius, who was a Stoic philosopher, he saw there, again, a sphere that would calculate the position of the sun, the moon, and the planets. In fact, I'm not sure about the text, if he says he saw, or he saw something that his friend had in constructed. So, please, I do not I did not know this part. So these two are the only citations that could mean the Antikythera mechanism. We have found, but of course the archaeologists now, they have to see, wherever they find the word sphere, I did have a look through the, the, the Greek, Greek language thesaurus, uh, and um, I have found a lot of places where the sphere is mentioned, and now I want the archaeologists to look in them and see if there's any connection with the Antikythera mechanism. Okay, last question. Uh, there are many artifacts, I mean, Greek artifacts that, that uh, I mean, historically exist. I don't know if there is anything, I mean, at least um, some instruments which uh, include part of uh, techniques and uh, technologies which are used in these instruments, uh, or everything which was in this instrument was an invention. Uh, do, you, do we know that or not? Well, I think that we know very little about the technology behind the machine. We know quite a little about the astronomy, but the technology is a surprise. I'm not sure how to answer your question. Because, yeah. because uh, apparently, the, um, a lot of techniques has been used in this instrument, okay? Do we know other instruments which have at least part of these, these techniques? Uh? No, this is very similar with the question if it is the only one that we have found. We have not found other mechanisms. There's a 10th ten, century AD Arabian um, astrolabe, astrolabe uh, that has seven gears, not as complicated as the Antikythera mechanism. There's also uh, some mention, so this is this, in fact, let me show you this slide. Uh, so this is now uh, something that was found in England in, tw in, the 13, in 1326 AD, uh, which is a clock mechanism, not as uh, complicated as the Antikythera mechanism. So these are slides that I had deleted. Now there's something in northern Italy, in Padova, the Astrarium of the Dondi, again, a horological machine, but not as complicated. The next complicated machine is the Prague clock that has very, very many similarities um, in, uh, uh, with the Antikythera mechanism. But that's 1,500 years later. <laughs> uh, sorry, Michael, yes. that, that's the important part, it's 1,500 years later, yes. Yes, thank you very much, John. Uh, he will be around in the afternoon, those who would like to yes. talk uh, details with him. Thanks a lot, it was a very interesting thank talk. You. Thank you. Yes. Please do ask me questions, it brings more research.